we're going to move into our charge to the church now, okay? Um, and I, I have to confess something to you as we roll into this, um, these next few minutes. And that is simply just sharing my heart with you. This feels like a very selfish message. Selfish message. It's hard to say. Um, but here's why. Because in light of their ordination, I'm getting ready essentially to, to spend the next few minutes telling you as church members how you're supposed to treat me. Okay? Um, so I just want you to know on the front end that I'm very uncomfortable doing this. But, but secondly, just know that I'm not mad at anybody in here. Okay? Nothing that you're going to hear is pointed at specifically at anybody. Right? Um, or anything like that. If, if I were asked to preach a charge to the congregation at somebody else's church, I would preach this exact same message. Okay, so I didn't tailor fit this thing for me or us or anything like that. And I just want you to know that. And also, for what it's worth, as a church with a plurality of elders, what that means is that everything aimed at the church here is also aimed at us as we submit to one another. Right. So we're not exempt from any of this either. Uh, but I just want you to know that even I get uncomfortable preaching certain things. Okay, and, and this is one of them. Um, but nonetheless, my personal feelings aside. It is important for us to know what the Bible teaches about the congregation's responsibility toward their pastors. Um, and, and this is one of those topics that really is severely neglected in many churches today. Many congregations have never heard, nor will they ever hear, a pastor stand up and teach them what the Bible says as it relates to this dynamic. Well, why is that? Well, it's because, as you know, in many churches today, pastors are scared to teach their convictions uh, for fear of being fired or, or fear of hostility from the congregation. Now, I'm very thankful that we don't have that issue here, um, and I know that we're super blessed in that regard. But I heard Steve Lawson say this one time. He was talking to pastors, and he said, when you stand up, you should preach with your resignation letter in your back pocket. Now, he didn't mean that literally, right? It's, it's metaphorical. But his point was that whenever a pastor steps into the pulpit to preach the Word of God, if preaching the truth means costing him his job, if it means costing him a little pushback, that's fine. And he ought to be more than prepared and willing for that to happen. Because the Word of God should take precedent over any of our comfort or fear. But the fact that such a quote even need exists is proof that many congregations either are not obedient or just flat out don't know what the Bible teaches as it relates um, to how they are to relate to their leadership. So... Let's get into the discussion, and this one, again, I don't have uh, six hours to preach this morning, so this one's going to be quick. It's a bulleted list, and we'll just work down through that, but I want to give you some biblical admonitions on this topic. So number one, as church member, or as a church member, you are to honor and love your pastors. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, he says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Now that word he uses there for respect, it can also be translated as to know or to acknowledge. And, and I think that's a better understanding in this passage. Um, that's the way that this word is used all over the place. And in light of him going on to say esteem them, I don't think it makes sense for him to say respect them right before that. Right. So I think that to know or to acknowledge is a better understanding. So what Paul is communicating here to the, to the church at Thessalonica is that they are to know um, or to acknowledge their leadership. Or as he puts it, those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Church, these are the pastors, okay? He's talking about the pastors of their congregation. Paul is saying you need to acknowledge, you need to know who they are. Well, why? He says because they're over you in the Lord. And that's key, in the Lord. But this is language here Paul is using that speaks of a delegated authority given to these men by God, given to the pastors of this church. Now, whenever you talk about authority and submission, you know, people start getting squeamish and start putting walls up. Um, so I want to ask you to not do that, okay? Because no pastor, no pastor has any authority in your life beyond the Word of God, okay? Beyond what this book teaches right here. But Paul is acknowledging here that God has set certain men apart to lead in the local church. And how is the local church expected to respond to these leaders that God has placed there? He says, esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Now, something I found really interesting studying this, and y'all know I'm not a Greek scholar, okay? I barely made it out of Harrisburg. But, but the people that are smarter than me, okay, put this together. But what I learned is that this phrase right here, 
is actually very hard to convey into English, from the Greek to the English, because it's such heavy language. We actually have a tough time emphasizing it in our English language. But Paul is using a combination of words here that essentially means this. He's saying you should think of or consider your leaders in a way that stretches out beyond all measure and goes beyond all things in an inexhaustible way. Okay, so this is a uh, super exaggeration, right? What Paul is saying is that you should hold your leaders in the highest esteem and greatest love possible. And again, he's using this exaggerate, the most exaggerated language that he possibly could to drive home this point. In other words, to make it simplified, this is to be in extreme love and extreme high regard for their pastors. And he tells us why. He says, because of their work. Paul doesn't say esteem them and love them because they're the coolest guys you know. He doesn't say to love them because they're the best speakers you've ever heard or because you have some side motive to get something from them or anything like that. No, he says, hold your pastors in the most extreme love and esteem you possibly could. Why? Because of their work, because of their faithfulness, because of their commitment to you day in and day out to helping you in your walk with the Lord, for being there to do life with you. And this love that Paul is talking about, this isn't this mushy, gushy, American, Greco-Roman idea of love, right? With Cupid and a little diaper and a bow and arrow. That's not what he's talking about. This love is an intentional love. This kind of love that Paul is uh, admonishing them toward is love that takes effort. It takes us to have some want to, if you want to put it in Arkansas terms. But this is the kind of love and esteem church that is infectious and will breed peace within a local body of believers. And I think that's why Paul tags that verse at the end there. He says, be at peace among yourselves, because this kind of love will breed peace, right? If there's love for the leadership, and that's evident, then it's also very likely that everyone will be loving toward one another. And church, that's a goal that we should all strive for, right? To love one another. But this kind of church environment is to be desired, right? But this kind of love and this esteem for the leadership uh, that Paul is admonishing them toward. This brings us to point number two. As a church member, you are to invest in your pastor's joy. Um, Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage of you. Now, how many of y'all firsthand have seen or, or even have heard um, horror stories about church business meetings that have gone sour? Right, we've been there, we've heard the story. Some of y'all are shaking your head. Yeah, all right. You ever heard of a pastor catching pushback from the congregation because he moved a, a stage decoration or painted a wall or something like that? I have a pastor friend, this is a true story. He told me that a deacon pulled him to the side after church one Sunday and he said, put his hand on his shoulder and he said, you see that clock on that wall back there? That's your best friend. Basically telling him, you're going too long, wrap it up, right? Situations like these, like what I've just described, are literally the exact opposite of what the author of Hebrews calls us to right here. Um, that word obey, where he says obey your leaders, it's also translated as trust in some places. And, and I want you to think about this. Paul is saying trust your leaders and submit to them. Does this not make sense? Uh, I think it does. Who wants to submit to or follow somebody that they don't trust? I mean, you wouldn't do it, right? Think about this in other situations of life where we see these dynamics of authority and submission. You know, because this isn't just in the church. Think about a marriage. Wives are called to submit to their husbands, right? They are to recognize his authority and follow him. But think about this. None of you women in here would have married your husband if you believed on your wedding day that he was some bozo that you couldn't rely on, right? I mean, none of us would have done it. On the contrary, you married him that day. Y'all cut it out. Yeah, Y'all married you married him that day because you did trust him. Or to put it another way, you chose to submit yourself to him because you trust him, right? That's the same idea here. The author of Hebrews recognizes the elder's authority is from God, and he's admonishing the church to trust them and to submit to them. Why? He says because they're keeping watch over your souls, and not only that, but they will have to give an account. You know what that means? That ought to terrify the three of us. I mean, quite frankly. You know what that means? That means that we're going to stand before God one day and give an account for the way that we shepherded each and every single one of you that's a part of this church. Um, this is not a small thing. 
This is not a light task. Uh, this is something that if somebody up here or in the, in the office doesn't take serious, he needs to get out of it immediately, right? But think about this. In light of all that he says, um, I'm sorry, in light of all that, he says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, right? For that would be of no advantage to you. Now notice who he places the burden on here. He doesn't place it on the pastors. It's on the congregation. He's saying it is the church's job to ensure that the elder can lead with joy and not with groaning. The congregation has the power in this regard to steer the ship, right? Good or bad, it's on them. Now why, let's answer this or ask this question, why would it be of no advantage to the congregation um, if the pastors have no joy? Why should that matter? Well, the pastor's primary concern um, for those under his care is their spiritual well-being. Right, it is encouraging each and every soul's um, growth in personal holiness. It's that they be sustained in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, think about this. All right, let's pull back out of here and think about other scenarios where there's submission and authority again. Think about this. What about the husband who goes to work all day? Okay, he's out, you know, digging the ditch or running the numbers, slaying dragons, whatever it is he does outside of the home. Okay, he's out all day. Maybe he's in the cold, you know, 10, 12 hours, whatever. And he comes home at the end of the day, right? And when he walks in the door, rather than being greeted um, by a cheerful family who has missed him, right, and is glad to see him home, glad that he has come back, he's greeted by no one. Think about that. He comes in, kicks his shoes off. There's nobody there. Nobody's happy to see him. And then his wife comes around the corner. And instead of a smile, she's got a scowl. And she starts in on him, right? Starts in nagging and complaining. And it could be about her day. could be about the kids. It could be about something he did. Whatever. You know, but she's all over him, just lighting him up. Well, let's say that they deal with it. And a little while later, that man, you know, he thinks, hey, God's called me to lead. I see some things in my home that I want to change. You know, I want to change the direction a little bit. And so he comes to his wife and he says, wife, here's where I think God's leading us. You know, here's what I think we should do. And you know how the wife receives it? Oh, no. Where it's on again. Round two. Right? She doesn't like feeling criticized or being told what to do. And so here we go again. It's a blow-up. Um, that husband, not only was he met with a cold home, but now twice he's met with anger, rage, fighting, and so forth. Okay? Poor guy, right? Let's shelve the husband. Think about a boss. Think about a boss at a job who has employees under him. And I know some of y'all have employees, all right? But I've had employees. Think about employees who refuse to do anything that he asks, okay? They're constantly late for work. When they get to work, when they finally decide to show up, they won't do anything. They've got a bad attitude. He suspects several of them are probably stealing, but his hands are tied by his boss who won't let him get rid of any of them. And yet, at the same time, every two weeks, he's getting chewed out for the state of things, right? So he's in literally a lose-lose situation and can do nothing about it. Think about both those scenarios, okay? Think about that husband and that manager, both of which who have had the joy zapped out of their calling, their responsibility, um, by those under their leadership, right? Those who should be submitted, receptive, encouraging, and so forth have sucked the joy out of both of these men. It does not take a rocket scientist to know how this is going to play out long term, right? Right? Despite how godly of a man he is, and despite his best efforts, you know what that man's going to do? Over time, he's going to stop caring. He's going to reach a point where he just throws his hands up, and he checks out, and he's done with it. And he says, I don't care anymore. You see, his task to lead has become such a burden that he's done with it. And, he, and by doing so, by that burden, he's doing it not with joy, but with groaning. Just like Paul says here, or sorry, just like the author of Hebrews says, Tip my cards there, didn't I? But listen, how do you think this will affect that man's family, that husband or that boss? Probably not good, right? If, if that leader is leading with no joy, he's in a lifeless situation that he hates and he wants out of it, is that going to absolutely benefit under anybody under his leadership at all? Probably not. Now, why would we expect things to be any different in the church life? And sadly, you see this all over the place. But... What is a joyless pastor going to do for his congregation? He's either, one, he's going to leave, right? He's going to be on the classifieds, find another job. 
uh, because he's just sick of it. Or if he doesn't leave, he's just going to check out and not care. And this happens, church. Um, I mean, I know men. This happens. We'll leave it at that. But on the flip side of that, think about something with me. Think about the husband who comes home after that long, hard day, been working, right, it's been rough, and he comes home to a warm, jovial, vibrant family, right, who is glad he's home. They're eager to welcome him back. They're happy to see him. I mean, they're welcoming when he walks in the door. And whenever he suggests something, they want to hear it because they trust him and they love him. He's their leader, right? Even if it's weird, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Because they understand that God has delegated that authority to him. Think about the boss who has wonderful employees who love their job. They're at work early. They go above and beyond and they do it well. How, what kind of effect do you think those scenarios would have on that husband or that boss? How would that, that setting affect their leadership? And in turn, how would their joyful leadership continue on and affect those employees or that family? That's the author of Hebrews' point here. He's saying, trust your leaders, follow them, and do this in a manner that encourages their joy. We have to give an account for you. Your leaders have to give an account for you. It is better for you and better for us. It's better for everybody if they can lead with joy. Amen? And thankfully, you guys are really good at that, okay? Um, I love this place. I really do. Um, Anyway, I better quit before I start crying. Y'all know me. Number three. And this one's going to be brief, okay? As a church member, you are to eliminate things that hinder his ability to teach. This one's pretty simple. You know, back in Acts 6, which we looked at um, earlier, the 12 said, remember, it is not right that we should give up preaching the Word of God to serve tables. You see, for them, again, the physical needs that needed met had actually become a hindrance and a burden that was keeping them from their primary task, which was preaching and teaching the people. Now, this is where we get into the area of service, members serving in the church, and that's a big discussion, right? But some of y'all are like me, and you're not that great at math, but I want to share with you a pretty simple algorithm that I think we can all understand, okay? If we have a workload, let's, I'm holding the ball, it's a workload, and we divide this thing up um, out among us, the more people that the workload is spread out among, that's less work that any single person has to do, right? Including the pastor's. Um, And that's the way it ought to be. Everybody ought to be involved. I I read a book one time, and the guy said in there, he said, in looking at the pattern of the New Testament, quote, an inactive church member is an oxymoron. In other words, a church member that is uninvolved in serving his or her church or inactive, he he or she is a walking contradiction, right? We are called to serve, and that's the principle that we see in Acts 6. You see, if you take the physical needs and burdens of the church off of the shoulders of the leadership, then they're able to focus that much more on what they're actually called to, their actual job, right, which is preaching and teaching the Word of God. So, again, that one's brief. Now, let's look at number four, and this is the fun one, all right? Don't throw nothing at me. But as a church member, you are to provide for your pastors, Now, for some reason, this thought often creeps into churches, and you see this everywhere, that pastors ought to either do what they do for free, especially if he's bivocational, or even if he is full-time, people think he shouldn't make that much money. Um, I actually one time was talking to a guy sitting in my office at my previous job, and he told me point blank, pastors ought to be poor, and they ought to take an oath of poverty before they can be in that office. And so I challenged the guy, I was like, where in the world do you get that? You know, and of course he couldn't provide anything. It was tradition from a certain tradition that rhymes with Schmoman Schmafflick, all right? But anyway, he couldn't tell me why he believed what he believed. He just believed that, okay? Families in the church today can be bringing in 100, 125, 150K a year, right? And there's nothing wrong with any of this. Don't hear me say that. But living in a nice house, driving brand new vehicles, wearing nice name brand clothes, And we will think, that's okay for all of us, but we'll let the pastor live in this cardboard box that the church owns, and we'll pay him 40 grand a year to take care of his three kids and his stay-at-home wife, and we'll call it good. Church, that is a crime. Uh, This is so backwards from what the Bible actually teaches, it ought to make you wonder how we ever even got to this point. But you really do see it all over the place. Now, in our American thinking, you know this, we pay for things based on or according to how much we value them. So think about this. If you were in a situation where you needed a lawyer, do you think you're going to pay that lawyer the same rate you pay the guy that mows your yard every two weeks? 
Not a chance, right? Of course you wouldn't. If you're in a situation where you need a lawyer, it's probably a big deal. And you understand that it's going to be very expensive. You don't, you don't walk into those things lightly. Um, so we understand then that a service uh, or whatever that we pay for has value to it, right? Well, church, how much today, and I'm not picking on you necessarily, I just mean as a whole, how much do we see the American church valuing their pastors? Um, and I dare say probably not much for the most part. Look at what uh, Paul says, and we've been over this before fairly recently, but look at what Paul says in Galatians 6, 6 and 7. He says, Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Now, this idea here that Paul says of sharing all good things, it's the idea of providing for the one who teaches, i.e., the pastor, right? Providing for him and his material needs. Now, I'm not going to name drop or call anybody out this morning, but I received a phone call very recently from one of you um, who offered to give me a handful of squirrels that he had just recently killed. Church, you know what that is? Really, that is sharing in all good things with your pastor. Now, Ken, I might argue with that, but I think they're good, all right? But that's what he's getting at. Uh, He's getting at providing, you know what I mean? Meeting these needs. But on this verse, Adam Clark writes this. This is good. He says, it appears that some of the believers in Galatia could receive the Christian ministry without contributing to its support. This is both ungrateful and base. We do not expect that a common schoolmaster will give up his time to teach our children their alphabet without being paid for it. How can we suppose that it is just for any person to sit under the preaching of the gospel in order to grow wise unto salvation by it and not contribute to the support of the spiritual teacher? Clark says, it is unjust. We see this same concept uh, spoken of in 1 Corinthians 9, really the whole chapter. But look at verses 13 and 14. Paul says this. He says, Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial alterings? So in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Paul's logic here is pretty clear. Um, Just like that temple worker is provided for by the temple, just like the people who serve at the altar are provided for by the altar. He's saying those who teach and preach in the church should be provided for by the church. Now, one other place we see this principle is 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. He says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So the principle here is the exact same thing that he's already said. Hey, you know, when that ox treads that grain, you wouldn't muzzle the ox so that he can enjoy the fruit of his work, right? Uh, and in the same way, he says the laborer deserves his wages. If he works, he deserves to be paid. And Paul equates this as receiving double honor, this payment, right? This compensation for his work is double honor, which is interesting because you remember what point number one was this morning? Love and honor your pastors. So he offers here a way not only to honor your pastors, but to provide them double honor. How so? By recognizing and compensating them for their work. Now, I realize this is not a popular teaching, um, but it's a biblical one nonetheless. There is no getting around the fact that the Bible makes clear um, that those who preach and teach should be compensated for by the church. Now, I have a a lot more I could say. I wish we had more time. Um, I don't want y'all mad at me, though, any more than you already are. But just a, quick, just a few quick other things to take home on this topic, what we're talking about today. Uh, our number one, and this one's really, really, really big, and I know that many of you do this and you tell us you do this. You have no idea what that means, okay? Sincerely. But you should pray for your pastors uh, often, right? And then you should let them know you're praying for them. Uh, we need that. that. You have no idea how encouraging that is to hear that uh, or to hear somebody just reach out and say, hey, well, you know, what do you got going on? Like, how can, how can I be there for you? Um, so that's a big one. Pray for your pastors. But another one, and this one's big, is offer praise and hear me when it's due. I'm not saying look for a reason to come up and say something nice every week, right? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if it's earned, if it's due, if it's sincere, don't keep it to yourself. Um, if y'all have ever seen a duck swimming in a pond or a river or something like that, and I know that you all have, you know that that duck on the top of that water, he's just gliding around as pretty and as smooth as can be. Right, the water's just barely parting as he moves along. But what you don't see is under the water, that duck's little legs are running wide open uh, to keep himself moving forward. Right? 
Well, in that same sense, just because you may see the three of us working and doing and it seems like we're gliding, okay? That does not mean that this is easy or that we're not under the water working our tails off, okay? So whenever you do come up occasionally and you do offer those words of encouragement, um, that is good for the soul. It really is. Uh, We got a very encouraging message this morning, um, and that's very meaningful. But here's the deal, church. I know I've talked to the leadership. I've talked to the church as a whole. But at the end of the day, whether you're leading the classroom, whether you're behind a pulpit, uh, or whether you're in the you know pew, so to speak, the chair, we don't have pews here. But the, here's the thing. We are all playing for the same team. And we are all, every one of us, tasked with inviting people into Christ's kingdom by means of his glorious gospel of grace. That, that message we preach that Jesus died for sinners. Right, And that he offers salvation as a free gift of his grace by faith alone, apart from anything you or I could ever do or ever bring to the table. That's the good news we hold to. That's the good news that leads us week in, week out to gather in worship. And that's the good news that has bonded us all together in Christ. Church today is an exciting day. And once again, I am excited for the future of this church. And I just want you to know this. And I don't speak for Jordan and Josh often, but I will here. All three of us consider it an honor and a blessing to have the privilege of pastoring New Heritage Church. Um, And we love you, and we are excited for our future.